Okay. Everybody hang on a second. Hold on. Hold on for one more day. Or one more second. <laughs> My, of course, I, I press go along. Let's scooch you in a little closer. My question sheet here. Hey, everybody. It's Allie from Padfoot Palms. So I am super excited to be doing um, this live Q&A for you guys today. Um, I have a ton of questions to go through. So um, this is um, a bunch of questions that came both from um, our Facebook group and some from the YouTube channel. So I do read your comments. If you're leaving comments on the videos, thank you for that. So, okay, let's just go ahead. Looks like we've got some people tuning in. Let me put the chat up here where I can see it. Okay, live chat, we're good. All right, hey, I hope everybody's having a great night. Okay, so let's just jump right into it with the very first question, shall we? So the first question is, how important is it to vary my dog's protein? So this is a question that I get asked a lot because traditionally both vets and the general public have been taught that you should just feed one food, you know, you pick a food, whatever your breeder was feeding, whatever your vet told you to feed, right? And that's what you should feed forever. Don't ever change their food. Well, they gave that advice because that's what they were taught right? And I'm sure that you've heard it before, you know, in your travels as well. But in, in what situation in life is that ever the case, right? Do we eat just one thing forever and ever and that's it? I mean, even animals in the wild, they don't eat just one thing. Unless you're a, gor a gorilla and you really like bananas, in which case you might only eat bananas if that was offered to you. But thankfully... We're not talking about gorillas. So, um, yeah, varying the protein is very important. The longer that you feed a single protein source, the more likely your dog is to become allergic to it. Um, and that goes the same for the other ingredients that are in your pet's food. Um, now, when I'm talking about allergies and developing allergies over the time, most of the time um, in those cases, we're talking about kibble. So if you are, for example, feeding a raw diet um, or even a home cooked diet, those proteins haven't been altered the same way as they have been in kibble. So we don't find that pets become allergic to them in the same way. It does happen, but it's not nearly as common as when they're eating kibble. So yeah, so protein, varying the proteins, extremely important. Um, I recommend that you do it at least once a month, right? So if you do feed kibble, you've got your bag, you know, maybe you get uh, a smaller bag so that you can rotate more often. And I have a whole video about rotation. So if you'd like more detailed information about that, definitely make sure you check that out. Okay, let's scoot you guys in a little bit. Looks like it's cutting off the top of my head. I'm sorry about that. I was headless alley for a minute. Okay, next up, um, I was thinking of switching to a raw diet. Um, as you know, small dogs and dental issues, I've always been told that kibble was the best in regards to dental, right? Kibble cleans teeth is the thought. Can you explain how raw diet is beneficial for teeth? So one of the key components to a raw diet is feeding raw meaty bones. Now you don't have to feed a 100% raw diet to feed raw meaty bones. So please keep that in mind. So one of the benefits of these raw meeting bones is it's most like what a dog would 
um, be doing in the wild, right? They would catch prey, they would gnaw on the bones, and that gnawing action of breaking down the bones, right, which they use for calcium, is what helps them remove that tartar from their teeth. And it doesn't do it 100%, right? So that's why you give them bones every day or every other day, depending on, you know, the diet that you're feeding. So, um, yeah, that's one of the huge things, one of the huge benefits of feeding a raw diet is specifically the raw meaty bones. Now, the flip side to that, if you're feeding kibble, um, especially if you're feeding one that's very high in carbs or um, it contains sugars, you know, you should really be looking at the ingredient list because they sneak those sugars in there. Um, that is all building up tartar on your dog's teeth. So that's why it's important that you give them some kind of chew every day. Now, because raw meaty bones, they do have quite a bit of calcium. If you're not feeding a raw diet, then you may want to space out the bones and do one, you know, every other day or every two days, depending on the size of your dog and what they can handle. Um, but yeah, like for my dogs, they do fantastic with raw meaty bones every other day. With small dogs, that could be um, chicken necks, it could be chicken feet, right? Which we've seen um, are very popular. They're very easy to get a hold of. Um, at, when you buy them at Walmart, they call them chicken paws. If you know why they call them chicken paws, please comment down below and tell me because I don't understand that. Um, but yeah, so they're, they're readily available and they're very easy. You can uh, portion them out. Let's say you have three dogs. You could put three uh, into a Ziploc bag, throw them in the freezer, right? Do that with the entire packet. Boom, they're all in the freezer. And then when you're ready to give that chicken foot to your dog, all you do is just pull out the bag. You can either give it to them frozen. Your dog may or may not like that. That's okay. It's trial and error at that point. Or you can thaw them out, you know, maybe in the fridge the night before, anticipating giving them the next day. So anyway, um, and I see that we're having a bunch of people join on. I'm so glad that you guys are here. Um, if you've missed the beginning portion, don't worry. This will be posted up onto our YouTube channel and I'll share it also in the Facebook group. So if you missed it from the beginning, don't worry. You'll be able to rewatch the beginning. Okay. Um, and just to clarify, in case I skipped over it, um, I know this is one of those things that, that say like, well, you need to feed a hard food because that's going to clean your dog's teeth. No. If that were true, then vets would not be making the hundreds and hundreds of dollars that they make when they do multiple dental exams on your dog every year, right? If, if that were true, we wouldn't be having all these dogs with dental issues. You see how that the two don't make sense. I got a thumbs up for that. So I'm, I'm guessing that somebody watching was like, hey, yeah. Hey, Latasha said, happy Friday. Happy Friday. You guys, I'm so happy it's Friday. Okay, so let's jump on to the next question, which is about luxating patellas. My puppy was just diagnosed with luxating patella in both rear legs. I'm so sorry. At this point, my vet said we should just keep an eye on it as it's too early to know if she will need surgery down the road. Yes, that's accurate. Um, if you watched any of our videos about Han Solo, he had um, a luxating patella in one of his back legs. Um, so I talk about that a lot in those videos. I would love any advice on how to avoid exacerbating the problem. She has never been allowed to jump on, on furniture, good. Is there something I should be doing for her nutritionally? Is it okay for her to go on walks? She is currently 20 weeks old and a whopping 3.8 pounds. Okay, so let's backtrack a little bit. Not jumping on furniture, fantastic. Um, if you look in some of my videos, you'll see that we have some of those foam stairs that go up against the couch. I don't recommend those for puppies because you really need to take the time to teach your dog how to use them. Um, and I find that right around like six to eight months, 
for puppies is when they start to become more coordinated. So that may be something that you'll look into in the future to help keep your dog from jumping uh, up and down off of furniture. So that's the first thing. Um, taking your dogs for walks, absolutely. You should not do anything that limits their exercise. Um, if you go back and look at some of our videos about Han Solo, our little uh, Pomeranian puppy with the luxating patella, we were constantly doing things to try to build up strength in his legs. So we were creating little obstacle courses for him. Um, he was doing some swim therapy, just in the tub swimming, which is a great exercise for them to do. It works all of their muscles all at the same time, um, but it doesn't put a lot of pressure on the joints. So I would highly recommend, even if it's just in your tub, teaching your puppy to swim, even if you're just in there with them, right? And you're just letting them kind of swim around, fantastic, that's really good. And just kind of support them underneath so that they don't feel panicky. Um, and I will say that if your puppy is not used to water, don't force it, right? Just kind of ease them into it, make sure you've got lots of treats, high value treats. Yay, good puppy, lots of you know praise, have somebody in there that can help you. Um, like I said, get in the tub with them. Those are all really great options. Now, nutritionally speaking, ideally, what I would say is that you wanna feed um, the best diet that you can, which is either going to be a raw diet or a home-cooked diet from a complete and balanced recipe. In the Padfoot Palms group, there are puppy recipes um, for either raw or home cooked in the file section of the group. And I highly recommend that you use those. Um, if that's not an option for you, then you're gonna wanna do the next best thing, which is gonna be a rehydrated freeze-dried raw um, or even uh, a high quality jerky style, right? Where all the moisture hasn't been sucked out. Um, you can really control a lot more with the home prepared foods. And that's really where you'll get into, you know, the supplements and things like that. So I will say for those of you out there that are dealing with dogs that have patella issues, whether they're a puppy or an adult, um, you want to ease into supplementation, right? I know that we have, as pet parents, we have a tendency to get really excited about supplements. And God bless you guys. I love you in the group. Like it, it's like every other day somebody's pinging me and they're like, hey, what about this supplement and this supplement? And I want to start this supplement. And I'm just take, take a deep breath. If you're going to supplement, you need to have a goal in mind. And what you don't want to do is you don't want to get this glucosamine and chondroitin chew and this green lip muscle powder and this, you know, and you start combining all these things together. And the next thing you know, you're messaging me and you're going, Allie, I'm using all these great supplements you're talking about, but my dog is pooping everywhere. So I am pleading with you now, don't overdo it. So specifically for this person with the 20 week old puppy, you are going to want to wait. I want you to concentrate on exercise, building up that puppy's muscles. And when I say exercise for a puppy this young, we're talking 15 minutes a day, right? Cause puppies, they, they run, they're crazy. They got a mind of their own. I don't know where they get all that energy. I wish I had like a 10th of that energy. I'm exhausted by noon. That's a whole nother story. So just 15 minutes of, of strengthening those legs and you don't wanna overdo it, especially for puppies this young. Um, later on, once your puppy is an adult, then you're going to want to start looking into um, doing an omega-369 supplement, right? Which is going to reduce inflammation in the joints and then adding something like a green-lipped muscle powder or uh, which helps lubricate the joints um, or oh, now I'm drawing a blank. 
it's been a long day. Anyway, um, there are quite a few options that you can look into as far as joint supplements. But if you have a puppy, then just wait until a little, uh, little later down the road. You don't want to do too much for a puppy. Tiffany said hello and thank you. You are most welcome. I'm glad you're here. Thanks for joining in. So, um, okay, so we got walks are good. I did touch on that. Yeah, so um, I would say most important, two most important takeaways for your puppy, focus on um, building up strength uh, in all the legs, not just that, those two in the back, um, and also feeding a high quality diet. Hi, Elizabeth. Thanks for tuning in. Okay, let's go on to the next question because we've got a ton of questions, guys. You, you'll be here with me all night. Okay. Hi, my palm mix used to eat kibbles. Now I changed to a completely raw food. Fantastic. I love to hear that. I'm feeding him with balanced meals and a chick a day. The, vo the vet said he is a bit overweight and has to lose some weight. After we swapped to raw, he gained more weight. How can I help him lose weight? Okay. This other one, there's a second part to this question. I'm going to stop right there so I don't forget to answer all of it. So first of all, fantastic. I'm so glad that you switched to a raw diet. Now, I know that when switching from kibble to raw, you're feeding what appears to be less food. And this is where a lot of people panic, right? Because they see it in the bowl and they go, oh my gosh, there's no way this is enough food. But you have to think about it like this. You have to think about it like I've got, um, you know, I've got a McDonald's hamburger over here that weighs eight ounces. We're, we're pretending. We know they don't weigh that much. And then I've got eight ounces of a steak filet over here. So the nutrients differences, right? This would be your kibble. This would be your raw food. That is hugely different as far as quality, nutrients, bioavailability of those nutrients, huge, huge difference. So when you were feeding kibble, you know, it may have said to feed, um, you know, let's say a fourth of a cup, right? And that takes up a certain amount of space in the bowl. But now you're feeding um, raw and it says to feed um, you know, three ounces at each meal and you're putting that in the bowl and you're going, well, this is not enough food. It happens to everybody. So if that's what's happening, you want to look at the raw food recipe that you're using and you want to make sure that you're feeding the appropriate amount for your dog's um, ideal weight right? Not their current weight. You want their ideal weight that you're shooting for. You want to make sure that you're feeding for their activity level, right? Because your couch potato senior dog is not going to burn nearly as many calories as your, you know, nine month old puppy, right? So you got to take that into account. Excuse me. So for most raw feeders, for an adult dog without any health issues, you want to start at feeding 3% of their ideal body weight. And it takes a little while for the weight to come off. So if, if you're thinking that you're going to see results in a week, you really have to pace yourself, right? Because they're much smaller. So it takes them a little while to lose weight. Now, the other thing you can do to help your dog lose weight, and I have this listed in the files of the Padfoot Palms group, it's the weight loss plan. So if you wanna go check it out, if you're concerned that your dog has a weight issue, you can absolutely do that. You can take half of your dog's food that you normally feed at a, at a meal, take half of it out and replace it with veggies. So you're gonna to wanna to stay away from starches you're looking for things like broccoli, cauliflower, squash, zucchini, stuff that's really yummy and scrumptious, 
and very fibrous, so it's nice and filling, but significantly lower in calories. Now, you don't want to feed that way long term, but if you do that in conjunction with adding 30 minutes of exercise, again for an adult dog, to your dog's daily regimen, you will find that it, at right about two and a half to three weeks, they're gonna be getting closer. They're going to lose weight and they're gonna be getting closer to their ideal weight. So um, that's what I would do as far as helping your dog lose weight. Those are a couple of options there. Okay, I tried giving him less food, also taking him for walks, but he has patella luxation. Okay, so um, falling back to, um, you could do, you know, just fetch kind of inside. You don't have to go on a long walk, especially if it's outside, which can be a little harder on their joints. Um, you know, you could lay a, a comforter out on the floor and just play fetch with them just so it's, you know, real soft and easy. Um, you could uh, do the swimming right which is great and depending on the size of your dog you could get away with doing that in your tub i know that not everybody has a pool um during normal circumstances when we're not quarantined um you can look into um they have doggy pools now that are available for public use at a lot of these doggy daycares and you could pay just to use the pool so that's an option. You can also look into um, any uh, canine sports facilities, right? Like a, a dock diving, right? That's where they throw the thing and the dog jumps off the dock. Um, they will have a pool that, you know, they would probably very happily take your money to rent out for an hour or so, so that you could, you know, could swim with your dog. So there are some options. Um, if taking your dog for a walk is not a good option for your dog specifically and you have to remember i'm giving you generalized ideas because i don't know your dog but you do know your dog so try to find something that works for them if they will um, if you have carpeted stairs and they will follow you no matter where you go then okay maybe it's time for you and puppers to go up and down the stairs four times and then take a break, and then maybe play fetch for a minute, and then go up and down the stairs another four times, right? I mean, that's a good amount of exercise, especially for a dog with um, patella issues. It's not terribly strenuous, but it's definitely gonna, you know, gonna burn some calories, which is good, and they don't have to do it really fast. So you could just go up the stairs slowly, they're gonna follow you slowly, you know, just to give you some ideas. Okay. And then other question, he is super sweet dog to me, but he seems to dislike everyone, barks at anyone who visits. He doesn't attack, just runs away. Should I consider hiring a dog behaviorist? So it's, this is a tough one because with small breeds, they have a tendency to be very right when you come up to the door right that's that's true of all small breeds it's not just a pomeranian thing but it's all about how you handle it when you're at the door so here's what i recommend if your dog is not aggressive right meaning actually trying to attack people then i would have someone there with you and have them hold the dog on a leash and make them sit away from the door. So like six feet away or more. They can see the door, right? But they can't like run up to the door and, and be territorial. And then what you wanna do is have somebody on the outside of the door, ring the doorbell, you open the door, hey, I'm so happy to see you, right? You hug, whatever your normal greeting is, have them walk in, dog's barking okay have them go back out and what you're going to do is you're going to do that over and over and over and over again and you're going to desensitize the dog to somebody coming in the house and as a side note um if there's anybody watching who makes commercials for tv 
I personally would love for them to stop putting doorbell sounds or knocking sounds inside of commercials because it is absolutely making my life miserable, okay? I have eight dogs. The doorbell goes off on that stupid Domino's commercial and every time and they're like, rawr, 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 rawr. so I feel your pain. Now, as far as um, should you hire a dog behaviorist, if your dog is aggressive to people coming over or um, is showing signs of being possessive of you, so let's say that your friend or your spouse comes and sits next to you when your dog is on your lap and they're growling at the other person, then yes, I would use a behaviorist. I personally recommend um, Marie over at Brainiac's Dog Training. Um, they're on Facebook. She does Skype sessions. I use her for all of my training purposes, both for behavioral issues and just regular training. She is absolutely phenomenal. I would, I would go check her out. And that's Marie at Brainiac's Dog Training on Facebook. If you need the link, just let me know um, and I'll be sure to get it to you. Um, and she's actually a member of the Padfoot Palms group, so I can tag her uh, on this video when I post it in there. Okay, I want to help my boy lose weight. All right, dog's getting chunky. I'm feeding Stella and Chewy freeze-dried raw with a little fruit and veggies that I cut up, so I cut back his intake. Okay, good. Snacks now consist of carrot sticks. Okay, you want to be careful with carrot because um, it still has an inherent natural sugar to it. So I would switch out the carrot sticks for celery sticks. I don't want to ask his vet because Royal Canon has stocked in the office. Okay, well, that's probably smart because that's what they put him on. Is there something else I should be doing? He is eight and just diagnosed with collapsing trachea. So I really want him to slip, slim down. Okay, so what I would do is remove the fruit, switch out your veggies, for celery, zucchini, squash, broccoli, cauliflower. Um, stay away from all starches, right? Just completely avoid them. No potatoes, no nothing, no sweet potato. Um, you could do pumpkin in moderation, that would be fine. Um, no fruit and whatever you're feeding, excuse me, for the Stella and Chewy freeze-dried raw, um, I would take half of it out and replace it with those veggies. So that way you're really just cutting the calories down because depending on how active your eight-year-old is um, and also considering the collapsing trachea, you're not going to be able to do a lot of exercise with him. Um, I do recommend that if you can get him up and moving and right? Get them to play fetch, all of those things that I've mentioned before. Those are all great options. Um, if not, then, you know, depending on how active he is, you're going to have to cut back on the food. And don't be afraid to cut out 50% of the food and replace it with vegetables. Is your dog going to be hungry? Yes. It's the nature of the beast. We've all been there, right? You've, you've been on that crash diet and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm starving. Just make sure that you are switching out, take out the fruit and use those veggies that are gonna work to your advantage because you can sit down and eat an entire bunch of celery and it actually, I don't know if you guys know this, but your body actually has to work harder and burns more calories to digest the celery than the, calor the calories you get from the celery. So that's humans, that's not dogs. So don't misunderstand. But um, the idea is still the same, right? You want low calorie, fibrous veggies. That's really what's gonna help your dog lose weight. Um, once you get them down to their ideal weight, 
then you can go ahead and start putting back a little bit more of the food. But remember, when you're looking at the Stella and Chewy um, freeze-dried raw bag, you want to be looking at the ideal weight for your dog. So if the ideal weight for your dog is 10 pounds and, um, you know, there's a listing for, oh, well, this is how much you feed for 15 pounds, then use the one above that, right? Because you're trying to get them to lose weight. Okay. All right, great. Let's go on to the next one. Why is baby refusing to drink water? I have been seeing this a lot lately. Oh, we got one. I'm here. The party can start now. Yeah! <laughs> Listen, the party has already started, okay? I brought the party, which is actually funny because I'm, I'm having a bit of a party tomorrow, so... That's perfect timing to bring the party. Okay, why is baby refusing to drink water? I'm seeing this a lot, so I was really happy that this question came in. So specifically, um, her dog did not have water for quite a few days, um, and it was very concerning. I'm just paraphrasing. <laughs> so um, I, I'm not 100% sure what causes this, but it it's just one of those things like dogs go through this now i will say if you are feeding a diet that's high in moisture whether that's raw food home cooked food canned food then they can start to drink less water because they're actually getting more moisture from the food which believe it or not is the way it's supposed to be if that's not the case and your dog stops drinking, um, there are a couple of different things you can do. You can try adding bone broth to the food. You can try adding um, a low sodium broth to the food. If you just have people broth, you just wanna make sure that you check the ingredients. Do not give any broth of any kind that has onion in it, right? Because onions are bad. Um, you can add kefir, you can add goat's milk, um, you can add watered down goat's milk. Like you don't even have to go, you know, full goat's milk. You could just do watered down goat's milk. You can make flavored ice cubes, um, which I've talked about in one of my previous videos. For example, if your dog goes crazy for strawberries and um, you could put some strawberries in ice cube trays, right? Freeze them up and then give them to your dog so that they have to actually lick through the ice to get to the strawberry. So those are just some of the things that you can do um, to help keep your dog hydrated. But the best thing you can do is um, if you're feeding kibble, soak it overnight in water. If they won't if they won't let you mix a liquid into their food, see if they'll still eat the food like that, like it soaked overnight. Um, and if you look at my rehydration video, I show you how I do that. Um, I'm specifically using goat's milk, but you could do the same thing with any liquid. I keep her hydrated with canned food and syringe water, but after a week she started back. Sorry. it. It takes the chat away faster than I could read it. Um, okay, well, as long as you're keeping the fluids up, um, and don't be afraid to get the um, unflavored Pedialyte. You can get, the, I like to get it and just keep it on hand because if I ever have a dog that has diarrhea, then that's what they get. So you can try mixing that into the food as well. Um, or if you're syringing it, then you can you can do that. But of course, if you can get your dog to drink water, that would be good. Now, the other thing that I want to mention with water is you want to make sure that your dog is drinking water out of a glass bowl, not stainless steel. I know that everybody, like stainless steel bowls are all the rage. Even if you want to continue to use those for food, that's fine. But for water, you have to use a glass bowl. And make sure that you're cleaning it every other day at the very least. I like to clean mine every day, but I've also got multiple dogs drinking out of multiple bowls. So um, the reason why I say do not use a metal bowl for water is 
it makes the water taste nasty. And if your dog is very sensitive to that, um, they're, they're not going to drink the water. And quite frankly, I don't blame them. I didn't understand the whole, you know, don't use a metal bowl for water until I tested it myself. I actually washed out the bowl, completely sanitized it, ran it through the dishwasher. I was like, okay, this is clean. I put water in it. I let that water sit for an hour and then I tasted it. And oh my gosh, it was like sucking on a penny. It was disgusting. So gave her Dasani water in a fancy bowl. She wanted no part of it. Okay, we well, have to be careful with um, Dasani with bottled water because um, a lot of those, they're finding that the pH is really high on those. So you wanna be careful with that. But I understand that you were just you know trying to do the best you can. You can try filtered water, you could try spring water. Um, as a human who is picky about the way water tastes, um, you know, I, I understand. You could also try to find something that's natural um, that you could mix into the water, like if your dog likes um, pineapple juice. You know, maybe you could mix to every um, three or four cups of water, you could mix, you know, four ounces of pineapple juice, and that might get her to drink, right? Maybe if you made it a little bit sweeter, that might do it. She started back normal now, but why would she go a week without water? I don't know. That's what I'm saying. I, I don't know what caused it. So definitely something to keep an eye on um, because that is not normal canine behavior. So, And you definitely want to make your vet aware of that as well. Okay. Jumping on to the next question. I have a four-month pom four month old Pomeranian. And all he wants to do is bite my fingers off. <laughs> Welcome to having a puppy. <laughs> I have to say, of all of the puppy things, that this is by far the most frustrating. It's like, I can take potty training. I can take, you know, teaching commands. I can take, you know, the lack of sleep for, you know, trying to get them to go potty in the right place. I can deal with all of that. But those little needle teeth, man, they get you and you're just like, oh, it hurts so bad. Okay. He lunges at my nose or face, bites toes and pants legs. I've tried all the regular suggestion by giving him a chew toy instead, but even when I do that, he still goes after my fingers. I've been struggling with it since I got him at two months old. It's not getting better. Do you have any ideas that may work for him to stop biting me? Okay. Yes, I have an idea, so don't panic. So what you may have on your hands is um, the beginnings of an aggressive chewer these are dogs that are very um, mouth driven, right? They like to chew on things. They like to chew shoes. They like to chew bones. They like to chew, right? And so th this may be the beginning of that. So don't feel like this is going to be the fix to all of your problems. Excuse me. You need to have a plan to go forward. So to start with, what you're going to do, and I actually showed this in one of my videos, um, I think it was with Han Solo, actually. I'm pretty sure, because he was a pretty bad biter there for a while. Um, assuming that you've tried everything else, this is always my last end of the road type of suggestion. So, and since you said that here, I'm gonna go ahead and jump straight to it rather than give you all those other suggestions. So what you do is the next time your puppy goes to bite you, you need to be ready. And what you're going to do is you're going to pinch down with your thumb or whatever fingers you can get into their mouth. And you're going to press down on the tongue, not back, right? You're not trying to choke them. You're going to press down on the tongue firmly, not hard. You're not trying to hurt them. Right? This is not this is not anything crazy, but you're gonna press down firmly, and what's gonna happen is your puppy is going to make this head motion. 
right? Because it's an odd sensation for someone to be pressing down on your tongue. You're just going to do it for a split second, right? Just count to two, one, you know, one, two, let go, pull your hand out, see what your puppy does. Now, the first time it happens, they may come back and try to bite you again. That's okay. Because initially, they're going to think it's a game, or they may think it's a game. That's okay. Don't get frustrated. You need to be very, very calm. And when they go to bite you again, you're going to press down. One, two. Make sure that it's firm and you're pressing down on the tongue. And then they're going to do that head shake motion. Make sure you let go. Don't hold them against their will. And the second time, you're going to say no. Very firm. You're not going to yell. Don't scream. But one, two, no. Very firm and stern. You're making a point. Like, hey, you biting me is not okay. And then just stand your ground. And you may, depending on how dense your puppy is, you may have to do this four, five, six times. Keep your cool. Eventually, your puppy will give up. I've had some puppies where they stopped biting after the third time of me doing the tongue compression. I've had other puppies where it took 20 times and then they finally figured out that biting me was no fun. So um, the other thing you can do if you want to assign it a command, you can say no bite. I usually just stick with no. And then um, you're going to do the same thing with your pants leg, right? You mentioned, I believe, yes. So when the puppy is on your pants leg, you're going to, like, let's say this is your pants. These are very stylish pants, by the way. Um, you're going to, let's say your foot's down here. You're going to slide your finger down, right? So you're using the fabric of the pants to to kind of angle to get into their mouth, even if it's just one finger, and press down on the tongue and affirm no. And at that point, if you can redirect them to something they can chew, then the combination of all three, again, you have to be consistent and not just you, everyone in your household has to be consistent. So that means that if you have children, if you have a family or friends come over, right? They all need to be doing the same thing. So it's just firm press on the tongue, one, two, let go, no, and then move on with your life. So um, that one has not failed me. So I'm hoping that it will help you. And don't give up, just keep at it, okay? Let me make sure we got that. Okay. My four pound dog, five years old, is on Stella and Chewy meat mixers. I know they are complete and balanced, but I should, sh but should I be giving her supplements and or omegas? Okay. So you're 100% correct. The food is complete and balanced. So that's good. So my question to you is, what are you supplementing for? What's your goal? Are you trying to um, get your dog's hair to grow faster? Are you trying to increase the diversity of their microbiome? Are you looking to help them with hot spots that they get during the summertime, right? I mean, there are a lot of things that you can supplement for. And I know you know you, know, you guys are getting sick of me saying this, but if you are going to supplement, you need to have a goal in mind. And then once you achieve that goal, then you either want to look at, you know, maybe backing off of the supplements for a while. You don't just add supplements forever. And I know supplement companies are gonna hate me for saying this, but your dog doesn't need to be on supplements forever. Especially if you're trying to do something like increase their microbiome, in their gut, right, so they have better digestion. Let's say you're adding um, a fermented veggie mixture 
to their food and maybe some uh, kefir, right? So you're trying to increase the, um, the digestive enzymes, then you should do that for a set period of time and then take a break for a set period of time. Um, and you'll find that human doctors will tell you the same thing if you're supplementing for yourself. Um, you don't want to just take the same vitamins every day, right? Because your body is just going to be like, get it out of here. So, um, yeah, so I would say that I need more information in order to better assist you with your question. Okay, I would love to hear about genetic testing. You did a few recently. Do you like Embark? Okay, so there's kind of multiple questions here, so I'm going to stop there. Um, do you like Embark? Yes, I do. Um, Embark is a fantastic company, and they are really doing a lot um, in as far as um, research, genetic research for canine disorders. Um, anyway, I won't bore you with all that, but th they do a lot in the breeding world, in the genetic disorders arena, like they're fantastic. Um, their test is not always the most affordable. So you really want to be hunting for coupons. Um, or if you can, if there's a holiday coming up and you're thinking about um, testing your dog, then wait until membrane supplement helps strengthen tracheal and bronchial tubes. That's a good question. Um, I'm going to have to look that one up for you. So, um, brain fart. Man, those little chat bombs just pop up and it's like my ADD brain is like, ooh, what are you saying? Okay, so um, Embark. Yeah, look for coupons. If there's a holiday coming up, then uh, wait to get your test uh, until that holiday because they usually run a sale. So um, I personally use Optimal Selection. I have a video on how to do the genetic testing. Um, even if you're not thinking about breeding, it's a great option. You can have your dogs um, tested and then you know, you know what kind of genetic disorders they may be prone to later on in life so that you can better prepare for that. So big fan of genetic testing. Um, okay, do you like Embark? Yes. One of the other tests best. Um, I feel like for what you get, optimal selection is more affordable. So that's why I went with them. As far as being the best, um, I mean, they're all pretty much about the same. They all do the same thing. You mentioned coupons you found last time. Can you tell us more? Okay, so you can look on their, if you're looking at doing genetic testing, regardless of which company you go for, check their website, check their Facebook page, check their Instagram, Google search. You know, if you're going to do, a, um, what is it, Paw Prints Genetics, type in Paw Prints Genetics coupon and just try them. And you'll, you'll be surprised. The other thing you can do um, that most people don't do is call them. Call the company and say, hey, I really want to genetically test my dog, but I don't have, you know, $250 right now. Are you running a sale or a coupon that I can use? And most of the time, they'll say, yeah, sure, here's this 30% off coupon. And guess what? That's money in your pocket. And we all love that. So don't be afraid to email or call a company and ask for a coupon because chances are they'll do it. Okay. Um, I did my first test with Embark. I'm not sure if that is the best one. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. Big fan of Embark. Okay. Next question. Did you go to school for nutrition or just learn from research? The answer is yes. <laughs> so yes, um, I went to school for, um, well, I have my bachelor's degree, right? And that's totally separate, but, um, 
yes, I did have schooling for um, canine nutrition, specifically small animal nutrition, which is why I do include some cat things. Although, um, I will be the first to tell you that my specialty is with canines. I can help with cat stuff, but I'm not as strong in the cat arena, but I still help people with their cat stuff and their ferret stuff too, surprisingly enough. Um, we do have some people in the Pathfoot Palms group who have ferrets, which is pretty fantastic. So, um, and then as far as the research part goes, yes, I eat, sleep, breathe, everything dog related. Um, if I have time to read a book, it's about breeding or it's about nutrition. All of the articles that I read, um, you know, everybody that I follow on YouTube, that I follow on Facebook, it's all nutrition based. Um, I attend a lot of seminars to keep up with my um, canine nutrition certification. So, um, and my hope is one day when we're not in quarantine to be able to go to the healthy dog expo which is usually up in the northeast um that would be fantastic so um so the answer to your question is yes and um i think that we have another question that's kind of like on the same lines here coming up soon so i'll go into more detail then okay do we get everybody yes okay we're already through the first page. We're doing great. You guys are doing great. You know that? I think we should do one of those um, Skype calls where like everybody's on the call together because then I could see you, right? And then you'd be busted, right? Because you're right now, you're in your kitchen making dinner, right? And I can see you, right? How crazy would that be? Make me something to eat. Okay. Okay. Talk about um, breeding a dilute gene to another dilute gene. Example, a blue to a lavender. This is a great question. Amanda says, you rock. Thanks for this. You're very welcome. And, if, and when we get to the end, if you guys have questions um, and you want me to take a look at them there in the chat, I will absolutely do that. So... I know that I've, you know, got a list here, but if you have questions, just hold them to the end. Um, the, the chat has a tendency to come up very quickly, and so I don't always catch it. But I will answer your questions, so don't worry. Okay, um, breeding a dilute gene to another dilute gene. For example, a blue to a lavender. Okay, so this is a rather controversial topic um, amongst breeders. Because back in the day, breeders were taught you don't breed a dilute to a dilute, right? And what is a dilute? It is the um, modifier on a gene that, for example, to make a blue dog, right, they have to have the dilute gene, which dilutes the dog from black. <laughs> Somebody said they're doing laundry. That's cute. Um, so it, it takes the dog from black to blue, right? Or what some people refer to as gray. So breeding a dilute to a dilute is breeding two pairs of recessive genes. And recessive to recessive can be problematic, which is why traditionally back in the day, they always taught breeders, you know, don't do that. Now we live in a completely different time and we can do genetic testing. People are tracking the lineage of their dogs. People have had their dogs and have been breeding for, you know, 20 years. Like they know what's in their lines. So the concern when you breed a dilute to a dilute is that you're going to create dogs that have alopecia which for those of you who don't know is a skin condition where the hair falls out. Um, it is a condition in Pomeranians. Um, it's very problematic. And if you find that it is in your lines, it can be devastating because 
it's one of those things that genetically they haven't pinpointed yet. And so if you have it, basically you, you have to eliminate that part of your breeding program, meaning that you get that dog spayed or neutered, you know, and, and stop breeding them. I don't want anybody to think I'm, you know, talking crazy here. Um, but it, it can be hard on breeders and certainly on puppy buyers who buy a puppy and they're expecting them to have a full coat and then they end up losing their hair. So breeding a dilute to a dilute for many, many years has thought to be um, this terrible thing that you don't do. To a certain extent, it can be problematic, but for a breeder who is educated and has taken the necessary steps, it, it's not necessarily a deal, a deal breaker. So if you have genetically tested your dogs, if you have color tested your dogs, if you know their lines, right, on both sides, then you can breed a dilute to a dilute and you can expect to have healthy puppies. But you have to be sure that your dogs, right, the adults that are breeding, they don't have any skin issues, right? They don't have any um, allergies, you know, all of these things. Because when you breed, when you breed recessive to recessive, you're going to get an exaggeration of both, right? Because they're going to be combined into that one puppy. So if you have a blue dog with um, terrible skin conditions, right? Not necessarily alopecia, but, you know, terrible skin conditions. And then you've got a lavender dog with um, horrible allergies, right? Has to be on all kinds of medications. And you breed them together. You see how right? The offspring is, is going to be a combination of the two. So you're not setting that puppy up for success. However, if you have a, um, a lavender and a blue and they're both very healthy, they're fed, you know, an incredibly nutritious diet and supplemented and they've been, had all their genetic testing, then you can breed the two together. And I know that some breeders will see this and immediately start screaming and pulling their hair out because they have been conditioned for so long that that's bad. But the other thing that you have to keep in mind is if it was so terrible, then why Mariners wouldn't exist as a breed? Just let that sink in for a second. That is an entire breed, a whole breed. Oh, Amanda's asking about Merle. Okay, hold on, we're gonna get to Merle. That's a whole breed that is various shades of blue. They are all blue. Now they call them champagne and silver and as with any breed, they've got their, you know, terminology for the colors, but essentially they're all blue. So if breeding blue to blue was so terrible, then why Mariners would have all been, you know, they would have all had alopecia and died out 10 years ago, right? But they didn't because responsible breeders are genetically testing, they're breeding their healthy adult dogs, right? If there are any problems in the lines, right, then they, they try to outsource or bring in other dogs so that they can genetically diversify, right? It's all about being a responsible breeder. So if you just want to get two dogs that are dilute and breed them together um, because you think you're going to make money, that's a very bad idea. Um, I do not recommend that and I do not support it. But if you want to do what's necessary, and you would like to breed the two together, then okay, you could potentially do that, but it requires a lot of work on the front end to make sure that you're doing it correctly. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and Amanda was just asking about Merle's. So I don't think we have any Merle questions here. So since that's related, I'm gonna jump onto that one. Merle's. There is a misconception 
that if you have a Merle dog, excuse me, that it's not healthy. Again, that is old, 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 you know, breeder's wives tale, I guess you could call it, you know, from way back in the day. Because we didn't have the kind of genetic information that we have now, right? I mean, there's all this testing, there's all this technology, we're, you know, we're learning more about our own genes. I mean, look at the 23andMe, you know, we're finding that we're related to people in other countries. And you see what I'm saying? So we have come a long way since the old days of, well, if you have a Merle, it's not healthy. That's, it's not true. So if you have a double Merle, that is where you start to get into the health problems. And double Merles come from um, a Merle and a Merle being bred together because irresponsible breeders who don't know anything about genetics, they think, okay, if I breed a Merle to a Merle, then my whole litter will be Merle and they'll sell better. Except that's not how the Merle gene works. It actually cancels itself out. So what you end up with are dogs that have a majority of white or um, all sorts of deformities. Um, they can have vision impairments, hearing impairments, that's where you go wrong with Merle. So I've been seeing, unfortunately, a lot in the poodle groups, there are posts that are going around that are like, Merle is bad and all Merle dogs are unhealthy and don't be fooled, Merle is terrible. You know, that's just more misinformation that's being spewed all over the place and it's unfortunate. So, um, yeah, so is Merle bad? No, not at all. Um, if, again, to be a responsible breeder, if you are going to breed Merles in your program, then you need to be smart about it. If you are just starting out, you need to choose, okay, am I gonna have Merle females or Merle males? Do not have both right? There's too much room for error, right? Like in my program, my Merles are, um, my well, Merle is Gooby. He's my stud. I decided that um, I wanted my male to be a Merle. If I was going to purchase another Merle, it would have to be male because I would not want to run the risk of potentially having a Merle Merle litter. Um, you know, my females are either solid or party colored, so that's fine. So you really, it really takes a lot of thought and preparedness to make sure that you're doing your breeding program correctly. Now, there are some breeders who have, you know, merles in both genders and whatever, and, and that's fine. I'm just telling you how I do it. Um, and the best way to set you up for success if you're just starting out. So just something to keep in mind. Um, but I would also like to add that Merles are fantastic um, and beautiful and I love them. I can't help it. So I am partial to Merle. Okay, so let's jump on to the next question. Um, okay, talking about testing, what are your thoughts on OFA versus a good qualified vet check? So this is a great question. Oh, Amanda said thanks. You're very welcome. So um, OFA, for those of you who don't know, is um, one of the institutions that breeders use to check the joints of their dogs. And I'm trying to be generalized about that um, because I know we have a, a mixed viewership. So they check um, elbows, they do elbows, they do um, knees, right? So OFA versus a vet check. Vet check, not really gonna tell you squat. Very subjective, 
right? I had one vet who told me that um, a dog had a luxating patella and then um, did a follow-up with a different vet in the office and they were like, no, this dog doesn't have a luxating patella, right? So a vet check, very subjective, depends on the vet. Um, as far as breed standards and being um, respected as a responsible breeder, vet check is going to mean nothing to anyone looking to purchase your puppies or to other breeders. So you'll want to keep that in mind. Now, OFA, they have their own process. Um, most of the time it requires sedation. Um, so let's say they're checking hips, then the dog would be sedated, laid out on a table, they do an x-ray of the hips, and then that x-ray is evaluated by, they send it off, and the OFA actually evaluates it, and then they score the hips, right, and then they show on a graph, um, you know, where your dog's hips are versus others that have been checked. Um, again, it's subjective, right? Because it depends on the three vets who are viewing it. Um, but it is widely accepted as being a good test. Certainly um, one of the better tests that, that we have available to check joints. Um, it can also be a really good way to find out if your dog has, um, you know, the beginnings of arthritis. I mean, they can really see a lot in an x-ray. Obviously, your vet is not going to be able to see that um, just looking at the dog. Now, not part of this question, but I do want to throw in is pen hip. P-E-N-N -N, hip. That is um, another option that breeders use. And what they check for is the elasticity in the joint. Now... Me personally, I think that that is a better test. They have a different evaluation. Um, the process is essentially the same, right? The dog is sedated, they're put on a table, they do an x-ray, but they're really looking more at the elasticity of the joint and how the joint fits into the socket. So um, I, I prefer pen hip. Um, when it comes time to test velocity, we will likely do um, pen hip and OFA just because OFA is widely accepted. Um, so yeah, so those are some options to think about. Uh, okay, I would love to know how you got started with palms. Okay, it's a good question. So when I met my wife. Um, she had a Pomeranian, right? Bear. He's our rescue Pom. And um, he's fantastic. We love him. And I told her that I would really like to get back into breeding because it had been a couple years, right? You know, and I hadn't been in it. So when I was talking to her about the different breeds that I had bred previously, and I was asking her, you know, what would be interesting for you? Because I wanted it to be something um, that we tried to do together. And I know that she loves dogs, loves them. And so I was hoping that she would love breeding. So what I did was I essentially said, okay, well, I tell you what, I'll let you choose right? Since you're the one who's taken a leap of faith, you know, I gave her the rundown about everything that goes on in breeding, the good and the bad. And I said, okay, so I'll let you choose. So she said, okay, well, you know, I want to choose, I want Pomeranians. And I didn't have any problem with that because really Pomeranians are adorable. Let's, let's just all be honest with ourselves. They are freaking cute. So that is how we started out with palms. And then um, later on down the road, um, we got Velocity, right? Our standard poodle puppy who will be part of our standard poodle breeding program eventually. Um, because I love that poodles don't shed. 
And I gotta tell you guys, if you don't have a poodle in your life and you have Pomeranians, don't get a poodle because you will regret all of the hair that is everywhere. Now keep in mind, I have seven Pomeranians. So, I mean, we, we end up cleaning up a lot of hair, but it's just, it's fantastic. Like they, they don't shed. It's great. So, okay. Um, okay, what is your funniest puppy or client story? Oh, what's your funniest story? Oh, man. Okay. Um, well, okay. So I would have to say that my funniest story, not necessarily a client story, but a dog story, is um, when I was in college, I had a Chihuahua mix. His name was Chewbacca. And he was like my right hand man. He went everywhere I went. We were just, we were buddies. I had rescued him um, from a very bad situation and he was a great dog, loved him. Anyway, he was a couple years old when my friends came to visit me um, in my apartment in college. And my friend at the time, we'll just call her Jay, was pregnant. Well, she came and sat down on the couch and apparently her pheromones were very strong and he came over and crawled into her lap and no joke, hiked his leg and peed all down the front of her. I about died. I was so more, I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. He had never done anything like that ever. Thankfully, this person happens to be my best friend and I love her to pieces and she took it really well, but I was absolutely mortified. I mean, he just peed like full blown all over the front of her. What she's sitting down on the couch. So, I mean, it's all on the front of her. So I would have to say that's my, my funniest dog story. Um, Okay, what is the most absurd question a potential puppy parent has asked you? <laughs> this is a good question. Um, there was a gentleman that I was speaking to one time about a puppy. And um, he had made it through the entire interview process, right? Talked with his wife. Um, you know, they had older children. They were all on board. Everybody was good. So we're kind of getting to the end of our little interview. And I said, okay, well, do you have any questions for me? And he said, yes. So what do I do if the puppy is not potty trained? And I was like, I'm sorry, what? And he was like, yeah, what, what do I do? You know, because I mean, obviously you're gonna train the puppy so it's potty trained when I get it. So what do I do if there's a problem with the potty training? And I was like, okay, let's backtrack a little bit. You do understand that a, an eight, nine, 10 week old, three month old, four month old, five, even six month old puppy may not be 100% potty trained. You, you do understand this, right? way over his head. He was thinking that he was gonna be purchasing a puppy and that it was gonna be 100% potty trained at eight weeks. I don't know where he got that idea, but it, it became like this really bad point of contention and I felt really bad, but I was like, okay, I guess this isn't gonna work out. And um, his wife was really upset. And she wanted me to lie to him. She had called me on a separate occasion and was saying, just tell him the puppy, he's not gonna get rid of it once we get it. And I was like, I'm sorry, ma'am. I, I can't do that to one of my puppies. Like he, he really thinks 
that this puppy is going to be completely potty trained. No, no. I, I think you guys should get an adult dog. So anyway, that was the most outrageous, absurd question um, that I have ever received. Um, I've received some other kind of out there kind of questions like, um, can I have a free puppy? I love that one. Sure, why not? Here you go, buddy. I don't know anything about you. You just sent me some random message on Facebook and you want a free dog. It's pretty scary. Okay, let's go on to the next question. Okay. How did you come to know so much about nutrition? Okay, so there's the other part of this question. I knew there was another one about nutrition. So, um... If canine nutrition is something that interests you, and I'll just cover this briefly, there are quite a few places where you can go and get your certification. There are also various seminars and things that you can learn on your own. Um, for example, if you're looking to get into raw feeding, uh, there's a group on Facebook, the Raw, raw Fed and Nerdy group. Um, they also have a website where you can take some courses to learn about canine nutrition. Those are all fantastic. I highly recommend those. Um, Dog Naturally Magazine has a course that you can take. Um, it's very expensive. I highly recommend that you wait until it goes on sale. It's usually like $500. So if you can catch it on sale, that's also a good one. Um, the uh, Companion Animal Science Institute, CASI, um, that they have um, a certification course and an advanced course. Those are great options. The Possible Canine has a certification course. That's also very good. Um, if I could make one suggestion to anyone who's looking to do these classes, just know that you have to treat it just like college courses. Um, it's not easy, It's the material is very dense, and you wanna make sure that you've got the time to devote to it, but, you know, because it's pricey, it, it's not cheap. I mean, it, it's essentially, you're gonna be at it for two years, and um, the books are expensive, like, you know, one of that, uh, that really big canine nutritionist book that you'll see on my shelf downstairs in some of my videos, um, that's $250 just for that book. So I definitely have a soft spot for veterinarians and uh, vet techs who have to purchase these very expensive medical books. Um, I feel your pain on that one. So yeah. Okay. Let's see. What triggered the initial concern over what is in kibble? This is a great question. So, um, as many of you know, when I was younger, I actually worked for um, pet food companies. And there is a lot that goes on behind the scenes that as you're exposed to it, you think, huh, well, that doesn't sound right. And you question it, but they just, you know, they're like, oh, no, don't worry about it. You know, they just kind of brush it under the rug. Well, I'm not a brush it under the rug kind of gal. So I started researching. And the more I started researching, the more I started to realize that, you know, these companies, they, they don't care about your dog. It's all about the bottom line. It's all about you know, how can they make the pet food as cheap as possible using whatever, you know, garbage ingredients they can scrape up from, you know, from the human food waste system, from the um, uh, livestock feeding system, from overseas. I, I mean, they cut so many corners, it's just... It'll leave you jaded. So, yeah, it's, it's rough. Um, 
at one point when I was in college, I was working for a pet food company and um, I had people that were, you know, coming to me and their dogs were having all these allergies and all these issues. And they kept, you know, and I was trying to, you know, okay, well, what do I do about this? And I talked to my manager and what do I do about this? I talked to my manager and it, it seemed like this vicious cycle right? So you get people on this food, then they start having problems, then they come back to you with their problems. And it's like, it was just around and around and around and there was no end. So it doesn't take very long of that for you to realize that there's something, you know, wrong. There's something wrong in the system. So um, one of the very first books that I read that was really an eye opener for me um, is called um, Food Pets Die For. Came out a long time ago. Um, still a very good read. Uh, I still have the copy and I highly recommend it to anybody uh, who's interested. It's not a very long book um, and some of the material is very dense, but most of it is kind of like uh, the show, the movie Pet Fooled. If you haven't seen that, I highly recommend you watch it. It'll really open your eyes about the whole pet food industry and what it's really about because um, I can tell you it's not about your pets. So, great question. Okay. Where do you find the never-ending new info on Kim kibble and seemingly everything else in the dog world? So this kind of goes back to everything I read is about dogs, right? All of the uh, YouTube channels I follow, all the Facebook um, pages that I follow. It's just I try to share all of the information that I come across. You know, I'm constantly trying to condense it into the Padfoot Palms group. Um, and a lot of times I'll see things that other people have posted. Um, you know, you'll I'll be scrolling through my feed and in the Pomeranians group, like three different times, I'll see questions about grain-free foods and grain-free foods. And, you know, what about grain-free foods and grain-free foods? And then finally I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go into the Padfoot Palms group and I'm going to make a post about grain-free foods because this is crazy. Nobody knows what's happening. So that's how we, that's how we ended up there. In case you were wondering. Okay. Let's see. Uh, can I come to Georgia and snuggle your puppies? Absolutely. Yes. Um, but only if you are a professional puppy snuggler, um, then yes. Okay, where do you find all of your recipes or you just come up with them on your own? This is a great question. So I actually do not have any of my personal recipes posted in the Padfoot Palms group at this time. Um, I'm currently working on a recipe book, so I'm hoping to be able to um, get that out to everybody, hopefully this year. And... Um, the recipes that we have available in the group are all free recipes that were either created by uh, veterinarians or other canine nutritionists. So that's where those came from. Okay, with diffuser and essential oils on the rise, do you have suggestions or concerns about them? Yes, um, I have a lot of concerns about them. So I had made a post about this much earlier when the Padfoot Palms group was significantly smaller, where I stated that because of my concern of the quality of essential oils, that I wasn't going to be recommending any essential oil brands. I wasn't going to be recommending um, any essential oil uh, specific oils themselves because I feel like it's this big gray area, right? 
And some companies will tell you, oh, well, we have a veterinarian on staff, or oh, our oils are specifically made for dogs, right? But there's no one double checking any of this. And that concerns me because I cannot tell you how many times I have scrolled through the Facebook feed and seen, hey, I started, you know, with such and such essential oil and within two hours, my dog had to be rushed to the emergency vet, right? Nobody wants to be in that position. Is this your full-time job? If not, what do you do? And Sue's. Okay, Amanda, great question. I'll jump over to that because that's much more interesting than me being concerned about essential oils. Um, so is this my full-time job? No. No, I do this um, for fun uh, as far as the YouTube channel goes. And uh, the Facebook group is a passion of mine. Um, I really, really love helping people. And I can do that by helping their pets. So... Um, so no, this is not my full-time job. Um, I do have a full-time job, that, which I'm very grateful for. Um, and right now it allows me to work from home and be able to spend a lot of time with my dogs who are now spoiled rotten. So, um, yeah, that's, that's what we'll say about that. And, um, just as a funny side note, uh, Suze and I actually work for the same company. So it's one of those, one of those weird things. I'll have to talk to you guys sometime about how we met, but we won't, we won't do that today. Okay. Let's see. Essential oils. Okay. Um, best flea treatment. I would definitely recommend that you check out my file on um, flea treatments, depending on the severity of how many fleas your dog has, will kind of depend on the treatment. Just very briefly here, um, I really like Wonderside products. I think they do a fantastic job. And um, neem spray, and specifically the Arc Naturals neem spray. So um, you can find those on Amazon, Chewy.com. You can find those, so that's what I like to use. Um, the Wonder Side, to be specific, I use the Yard one to treat the yard with diatomaceous earth, which you can pick up at Tractor Supply. Um, and I use the Wonder Side spray, which you actually spray on your dogs or yourself for that matter. When do you sleep? That is a very good question. Um, uh, never. <laughs> I wish I got more sleep. Um, <laughs> so for a while there, especially when Velocity was still very young, I, I was going to bed at like 11, 12, getting up at three or four. So house training or crate training, potty training in general, um, you just have to be prepared to not get a lot of sleep. So we're doing a lot better now that she's older right she's like eight months now she's fantastic she's absolutely perfect um i wish that the pomeranians were as wonderfully potty trained as she is so anyway getting a lot more sleep now but i don't ever get enough sleep i i get sucked up into answering questions or reading things online and or reading one of my new books and i'm like there's just not enough hours in the day Okay, what was your first dog breed and the dog's name? So when I was four years old, four or five, um, my aunt actually bred Australian Shepherds. So my first dog was an Australian Shepherd puppy and his name was Cowboy. And because I was an only child, I used to tell people that he was my brother. So I, no joke, like meeting people out, you know, in the world as children do when they're out with their parents, um, when people would say, oh, is this your daughter? And I would say, yes, you know, my name is Allie. My brother's at home and his name is Cowboy. 
<sighs> I love that dog. We did everything together. I, um, I saw some movie as a child where, you know, there were sledding dogs. And so I created this harness for him out of rope and stuff that I found in the garage. And I made a sled and then I put wood on the sled. We used to live in Virginia and no joke, he would be pulling the sled of wood around in the yard. He was the best dog. He was the best dog ever. So um, there will always be a soft spot in my heart for Australian Shepherds because they, they are really great dogs. Okay. What happened first, uh, dog breeding or nutritionist? Dog breeding. Um, I have much more experience with dog breeding. Um, the nutrition thing, that has been accumulating, you know, over the past, I would say probably like eight, eight to 10 years, but the dog breeding, that goes back pretty far. Okay. Have you ever thought of putting a recipe book together? <laughs> um, okay, we'll answer this in two questions. So, have you ever thought of putting a recipe book together? Yes, I'm currently working on one. Um, I find that a lot of the recipe books that are out on the market, they're just, you know, it's either too hard to find the ingredients or they don't give you an exact name of a supplement. Like, I'm, I'm hoping to make something that's just makes it so easy for people. So yes, recipe book coming. Um, I'll also be re releasing um, little recipe bundles, which will be nice because some people just want a couple of recipes, right, that they can rotate through. They don't want a whole book. So I'll be doing that as well. Um, and then the second part of that is, would you make a recipe book um, that can be purchased along with the supplements to add to each recipe. To that part of the question, no. Um, also, in conjunction with this question, would I ever make my own dog food? The answer is no. Not a commercial kibble or freeze dry or something like that. Um, I find that even companies with the best intentions once they start making a lot of money, they really lose sight of the customer and the pet and the product and it, it becomes about the money. And I don't ever want to do that. So I, I don't do this to make money. Um, and I, and I wouldn't do that. And I, I don't want to sell people a supplement. I mean, ideally, I want them to, to feed a great food, potentially from a recipe, so that they don't need a supplement, right? They can use food as medicine, right? Who was it that said that? I don't remember. Some famous Greek dude. He said, hey, let food be your medicine, dude. I believe that's an exact quote. Okay, so last question that we've got um, from the question list, and then I'll jump in here. Uh, I want to dehydrate salmon for my girl. Should I freeze it first? Yes, you should freeze it for at least three weeks. And that's true of any fish or game. Um, if you, if you want to feed it, you should freeze. Free Let's try that again. You should freeze it for at least three weeks. The idea behind that is that it um, could, it kills off any potential parasites that might be in the, in the flesh. Man, I'm trouble. Okay, yeah, you're welcome. I mean, I just totally stumbled through that, Latasha. I'm so sorry. I was trying to spit it out for you, but I just couldn't. Okay, last question, and then we'll jump onto the questions if anybody has them in the chat. Okay. Puppy woke up in the middle of the night and I caught her eating poo on camera. Is this normal? I see a lot of questions about 
dogs eating poop. So first of all, is this normal? Yes and no. Dogs eat poop, right? They'll eat their own poop. They eat somebody else's poop. They eat another animal's poop. Dogs are weird. It doesn't mean there's a nutritional um, deficiency. Uh, you know, it, it, it could just be a behavioral problem. This specifically is a puppy. So for this specific situation, I would say, um, is your puppy getting fed enough during the day? Puppies need to be fed three, four, five times a day, depending on how small they are. Um, if they're a, a tiny toy breed, they may need access to food 24 seven. So you need to take that into account. Um, the other thing I would say is, are you feeding too many treats or potentially a treat that is still visible in the poo? Not to be gross. For example, carrots. Love giving my dogs carrots, but it can be problematic, you know. Gotta watch them so they don't eat the poo. So, um, I would say make sure that your puppy has plenty of food. If they're waking up in the middle of the night to eat, my guess would be um, that they're hungry. So you should probably have some food um, in their pen or their crate, or you should look at feeding them more in the during the day, um, or you may be putting them to bed too early, right? And they're so they're waking up in the middle of the night and they're like, "Hey, I'm awake. All right, let's go. Let's play." Oh, nobody's here to play with me. Okay, I'm just gonna have a little uh, tootsie roll. That's gross. I know. I'm so sorry. Okay, we're ready. Are we ready? Are you ready for this? Dun, 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 dun. Okay, sorry. 90s kid. Latasha, thank you for laughing at that. I appreciate you. <laughs> okay, so if you guys have any questions, I am now looking at the screen. <laughs> you guys, my dad is watching the live stream. <laughs> He just said stop with the poo already. Thanks, Dad. I love you. Thank you for your support. <laughs> the text message just popped up on my screen. That was great. Oh, <sighs> okay. Anyway, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to comment them down below. I'm looking at the screen now, so I can um I can answer any of the questions that you might have. Um let's see. If it'll let me, okay. Okay, it won't let me go back and look at ones that people have posted while I was talking, so. Latasha said I can't get past the Tootsie Roll. That's funny. Okay, what about breeding Merle to solid, white, or sables? I heard that's bad. Okay, great. So let's stop there. Does stainless steel boys cause tear stains? It can. Okay, I should have brought a pen. Just remind me in a, in a second about stainless steel boy, bowls and tear stains. Okay, so Merle, yes, you do not want to breed Merle to um, whites. Um, any of the light colors, creams, um, a very light orange, you, you want to avoid that. So the reason being is, let's go with cream. So cream, the genetic um, descriptor for cream is EE, -E, and you'll see it as little e, little e, when you're looking at a, um, a genetic test. Cream covers everything. So if you have a dog that's Merle, and you breed them to a cream, and cream covers everything, then when you have the litter of puppies, let's, for the sake of argument, say that they come out and they're all cream. Well, the cream is covering the Merle. So now you have no idea without color testing those puppies if they are Merle or not, which is dangerous because if you sell one of those puppies and someone's thinking that, oh, okay, hang on, Dad. You're going to have to text me that question again in just a second because it, it, it scrolled away from me. Okay, so 
the cream will cover the merle so that um, you don't know that the dog is merle. It just looks cream. So without color testing, if you then sell that puppy and someone thinking that it's cream, right, and not merle, breeds it to another merle, then that's a merle merle breeding right? And nobody wants to be responsible for bringing sick puppies into the world, right? That, that's not the point of breeding. So um, yes, that's true of um, all of the lighter colors. You really want to steer away from that. You want to go with the darker colors. Um, and the same goes with sable because of how sable acts on the coat um, by fading some of the colors. With a sable, so if this is a hair, um, the hair will be lighter, darker, dark, right? So what what sabling does is it has this, you've got this variegation of color along the line of the hair, and when you couple that with merle, it can be problematic. Again, it can make the dog just look sable so it doesn't look merle which could be problematic. So, plus the whole point of breeding a Merle is to create gorgeous Merles, right? So when you're looking to breed Merles, you wanna breed Merles that have very striking um, color patterns, that have large patches of color, right? You'll see some Merles that just look like they have freckles all over, which is fine. Um, and, and some breeders really like that look, but you have to understand that however, the way the Merle gene looks, however that dog, that patterning looks, that's how the puppies are gonna look for the most part. There's, there's some variation, but for the most part, that's how they're gonna look. So keep that in mind. Okay, before I forget, the tear staining question. Um, if you go to the Padfoot Palms group, there is an entire file on tear staining. And yes, part of the problem for some dogs with tear staining um, is that, and I'm sure everybody's encountered it at some point with their dog's bowl, there will be slime, right? It's like a, a film on the bowl. That's bacteria. And that can be problematic for your dog. And especially those who are sensitive to it, um, it, it can contribute to tear staining. So... Again, I don't recommend that you use stainless steel bowls for water anyway. If you missed that portion of the live, don't worry. You can go back or you can check out my video um, that talks all about bowls. I go in depth about each one and washing them and all that fun stuff. So yeah. Okay, so my dad had actually texted a question. So dad, if you're still watching, go ahead and retext the question to me and I'll wait for it to pop up here. Um, he also has a Pomeranian. Um, she is a, a gorgeous uh, orange Pomeranian. You've probably seen her. Okay, Angel seems to have dreams where she dreams and make noises in her sleep. Could it be food, a food allergy? No, um, most dogs, when they reach REM, they will, um, you'll see them, they'll, they'll kick in their, sleep and they're just dreaming and it's okay it's probably not food related um i will say that if your dog is um you know having these dreams and then they're waking up and coughing that can be food related but it could mean that your dog is eating too late in the evening and they're essentially getting acid reflux, right? They're, they're running around in their sleep and then um, waking themselves up. So, but no, that's totally normal, totally natural. Dog's dream. Um, I like to call it chasing dragons, right? They're chasing dragons in their sleep. If you know the cream has no merle, can they be bred to merle or would it be covered up? It would be covered up. It, it would totally be covered up. When, you, when you're breeding to cream, you should really be looking to produce more cream because cream, think of it like a blanket, it is going to cover up whatever it is you're trying to create. So 
um, you know, and I'm saying this in very general terms, if you're looking for more specific information about uh, coat color genetics, there's a fantastic Facebook group I absolutely recommend that you join. Um, it's Coat Color Genetics on Facebook, that's the name of it. And um, you can learn more about um, what the base color is. For example, um, if you have a cream who has a brown nose and brown um, pads of their feet, then their base is actually chocolate. So if you bred them to a chocolate, right, then you would be more likely to have creams and chocolates. So the, it, it gets pretty complicated, but um, that's one of the reasons why it's so important to do the color testing, which is part of the genetic testing panel that you can do um, through Embark, Optimal Selection, Paw Print Genetics, uh, Wisdom Panel, I'm just trying to name a bunch of them for you guys in case you're interested. Um, if you want to do Merle testing to find out specifically what Merle you have, there is a European company called Tilia, T-I-L-I-A, I believe is how you spell it. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. What else you guys got for me? Give me questions. Ready? Go. Don't everybody talk at once. I take that back. Everybody talk at once. <laughs> okay. We'll give people a, a minute to type here. Um, oh, hey, here we go. What is your oldest lived palm? So um, right now, our oldest palm is, we think he's nine, eight or nine. Yeah. Probably nine. Um, that's Bear. He's our rescue palm. Um, oh, and I had said to one of the group members I was going to talk about Bear. So Bear, when I first met Suze, um, he was overweight. He was on a terrible kibble, which, don't get me wrong, that was like my first mission was to convert her to a better food, um, which I was very happy that she was open to. So he was overweight and he had horrible luxating patellas um, in his back legs. And through moving him to a homemade food and supplementation with um, Omega 369 supplement, uh, green lipped muscle, reducing the amount of um, inflammatory ingredients in the homemade food, um, avoiding things like, um, you know, peppers, right? Like you'll see recipes that call for red pepper or green pepper. Those can cause inflammation in the joints, you know, if fed over a long period of time. So, um, yeah, so by limiting those things, we were actually able to almost completely remove all of his symptoms of the luxating patella. Now, he still has luxating patella, so please do not misunderstand me. I'm not saying, we cured him, he's cured, or just placed hands on him and he's cured. I'm not, I'm not saying that. But I am saying that we improved his quality of life by, you know, 360%. So, um, we were able to, thank you, Latasha. Um, we were able to get him down to a manageable weight. Oh, my palm is 14, just curious. Um, I was actually working with a client the other day. Um, her palm is 17. So, yeah, I've, I've seen some palms that get up there. But anyway, um, yeah, Bear is one of my biggest success stories. He, he has been fit and trim um, ever since I got the weight off of him. Um, he runs and plays with the puppies all the time. He can almost keep up with Velocity, which now that she has reached her full size, um, is pretty impressive for what most vets consider to be a senior dog. So to keep up with an eight-month-old standard poodle is, um, 
I give him kudos for that. He he does a really good job. So it's there's a lot to be said about nutrition and you know what you put into your dog's body and how they can really utilize it to live their best life, you know. And that's what I'm all about. And that's what Pad Foot Palms is all about. And since you're here, I'm guessing that's what you're all about. And I love that about you. <laughs> okay, what else you got? We got we got more people. We got time for questions. Hey, Anthony said he made it. Anthony, you are late to the party. We're at the end, my friend. I'm just taking questions from people. Look, I look. I already went through all these questions. You missed it, man, but it's okay. Don't panic, because I'm going to upload it to the Padfoot Palms YouTube channel. And, of course, I'm going to share it in the Facebook group, so you can go back and watch all the fun stuff. But since you're late, now you have to come up with a question. So we'll wait while you come up with a question. No pressure. I need that little SpongeBob meme three hours later. That's the only thing about doing live. You know, that's one thing I, that I have a lot of fun with. Can I give Angel asparagus stalks? Okay, my dad's sending in another question. It could be my dad or it could be his wife. Either way, thank you for sending in your questions. Um, yes, you can give asparagus stalks. Um, there are a couple of things to keep in mind. If you, um, if you're concerned about your dog being able to chew them oh oh no anthony was in a wreck a couple of days ago oh now i feel bad well anthony i'm, I'm glad you're okay and i'm glad that you're here so make sure you take it easy that's horrible um okay so asparagus yes you can give asparagus um I like to give my dogs the part, here's what I do. Guys, I'm all over the place. Let's rein it in, Allie, let's rein it in. Okay, here's what I do when I'm making asparagus. So you've got the asparagus stalk. Sounds like a storm is coming. So, um, asparagus. Here's the, the end and here is what I call the butt. I don't know if it's actually called a butt, but it's, you know, like the real stocky end that nobody eats. Hey, Latasha's in Georgia. Fantastic. Me too. So, um, there's this part down at the end that's really dense that you don't really eat, right? And you cut that off and what do you do? You throw it away and you waste it. No more, my friends. So what I do is I cut that part off. So you've got your part of the asparagus you're going to eat. And then... I put all of it, including the chunks that I'm not going to eat, into the steamer. I actually, I need to show you guys my steamer. It's fantastic. So um, I put it in the steamer, I steam all of it, um, and you don't want to steam it until it's mushy, but you just kind of want to let the cell walls break down a little bit, right? So it's not quite so dense. And um, then I give those stalk ends to the dogs. And then, of course, the rest of the asparagus, Susan and I eat for dinner. So, yeah, um, the only thing that you need to keep in mind with asparagus is that if you give a lot of it at one time. Oh, OK, we'll talk about Twix and Rocky. Hello from Tunisia. That's so cool. Hi, Adam. OK, so um, <laughs> with asparagus, this whole live thing is perfect for me because this is how my brain functions. Like, do, 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 do. Anyway, so uh, if you give a lot of asparagus, it will make their urine smell very, very strong. And depending on what color the asparagus is, um, if it's the green variety, it may make their urine very, very yellow. Not to be alarmed, it's just some of the, the natural components that are in asparagus. Um, that actually happens to people too. Um, if it's the white variety, then you likely will just have a strong urine smell, but not so much the color. So if you, um, you know, if you like white asparagus, which I do, it's delicious. So yeah, there are a lot of, 
um, you know, veggies that when we're preparing them, right, we just kind of cut the stalks off and things like that. Um, and we're, we're wasting all of that food. You could be giving it to your dog. Um, assuming that it is a vegetable that's safe for dogs. So that was a great question. Okay. So back to the other question about how are Twix and Rocky doing? They are doing fantastic. So we have got our x-rays scheduled for uh, the middle of this month, and I'll be doing videos of that. And that's when we find out how many puppies they're going to be having. So they are roughly, their due dates are roughly a week apart from each other. So I'm going to try to be sneaky and take them both to the same x-ray appointment and see if the bones have calcified enough that we'll be able to see them. So fingers crossed. Um, I'm guessing because they're so close in due date um, that it, it'll be fine and we'll be able to see them. Um, and for those of you who don't know, there is a certain point where puppy bones are dense enough that they can be seen on an x-ray. It's usually um, uh, right about a week before the due date. So that's what I'm talking about, being able to see them on an x-ray. If you take them too soon, um, then you'll still see that there are little puppy skeletons in their skeletons. That sounds so weird. But you'll be able to see their bones on the x-ray, um, but they won't be very dark. It'll be very light, and that can make it uh, challenging when you're trying to count how many puppies there are. So uh, we're hoping for small litters. We're not hoping for big litters. So four is my favorite number. So if they both had four puppies, then that would be great. I would be excited about that. But yeah, they're doing good. Um, gaining a lot of weight. They finally started eating really well, which is great because they had terrible morning sickness. Um, so yeah. I feel for them. I, I also feel for humans who become pregnant and have to deal with that. That's morning sickness doesn't sound fun because really they call it morning sickness, but really it's all day sickness. They should just call it uh, pregnancy sickness. You, you gonna be sick cause you pregnant. That's what they should call it. <laughs> so, but they're doing good. They're doing good. Okay. What you got for me? Got any questions? Okay, we'll give people just a few minutes and see if we've got any questions. Okay. Well, if we don't have any more questions, then I am going to go ahead and wrap this up. And I'm talking slowly, just in case there's another question. Because someone might be frantically typing right now and going, wait, 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 I gotta ask my question. Or maybe they're cooking dinner. Comment down below and tell me what you've been doing this whole time that you've been watching the live. I would love to know. Usually when I do the lives on a Friday night, people are cooking dinner. Somebody earlier commented and said they were doing laundry. So what are you doing right now? Tell me what you're doing. Okay. Oh, here we go. I'm getting a palm next year. The mother estimated to be five pounds, the father three pounds, which your personal estimate way fully grown. Okay, so making dinner, having a cocktail. All right, it's cocktail time. Okay, so backtrack. So um, one of the parents is five pounds, the other is three pounds. So usually what will happen is that the range for uh, the adult weight of that puppy, right, from those parents would be between three and five pounds. Um, a lot of it is just going to depend on the structure of those dogs. 
Um, I've seen some five pound palms that because, you know, they're, they're taller um, or they're very broad shouldered, right? When they kind of get all their hair, they look much bigger than they are. So um, there's always the off chance that you could get what's called a throwback which um, is where you get a puppy that's actually bigger than the parents. Um, that's always a possibility. However, if the two dogs that you're referring to that you're getting your palm puppy from, if they come from lines where the dogs were about that size, right? If they were between um, three and six pounds, let's say, for all of their lineage, then chances are, genetically speaking, the consistency would be there. And so you could say, Juan says, hello, hello. Um, you could say that your dog is probably going to be between three and five pounds. Um, but I always tell people that, you know, that's just a guesstimate. And um, I'm sure that your breeder will tell you that they don't guarantee size. Uh, it's very hard to do that, to guarantee size. So, but yeah. Um, there is a website that you can check out. It's called puppyweights.com. And what you can do is you can plug in the age of your dog. You're very welcome, Amanda. Um, you can plug in the age of your dog and then the weight. And then um, it will give you an S and the breed, sorry and it will give you an estimation of their adult weight. So again, not 100% reliable, but I have found that puppyweights.com um, is usually within a pound or two and, and pretty accurate for Pomeranians. So yeah, so check that out. Um, you'll see when the website comes up, it's got like a green banner and like a puppy and he's lifting weights, right? Silly. Anyway. All right, what you got? Got any other questions, comments, concerns? Okay. Um, if you're wondering about my spooky background um it, it's actually Suze's. i'm dealing with a migraine all day but i just ate a sandwich while watching and learning from you well i'm glad that your migraine is better amanda i i get migraines sometimes too and i gotta tell you that's that's like one of the worst things ever i mean it'll it'll completely knock you out for the whole day so um yeah so i'm glad you're doing better um Suze has been talking about wanting to do her own YouTube channel. She's thinking about doing something, um, you know, like paranormal, conspiracy theory, spooky ghosts and sightings and stuff. I don't know what she's going to do. So anyway, this is her background. If you're, if you're wondering about that. So I just figured it'd be fun. To sit in front of it. it looks pretty cool though right okay well I'm not seeing any more questions so we'll go ahead and wrap this up thank you guys so much for tuning in I really appreciate it um, if you think of a question uh, or you have something that you'd like for me to answer please jump over into the Padfoot Palms Facebook group and post your question there um, I am constantly you know going through the feed answering questions um, I have Latasha thank you have a great weekend um, I have some phenomenal phenomenal moderators over there um, and they are also a wealth of knowledge so they can help you too or they can tag me or you can tag me you can be like hey Allie tag you're it you know and I'll uh, I'll come answer your question so I think that's it for us tonight we had quite a few people join that's fantastic okay all right thank you guys so much for being here I'm gonna go ahead and sign off for the night and um, do me a favor, hug all of your dogs for me and tell them that they were good. 
even if they weren't. I want you to lie to them and make them feel good about themselves because they deserve it. Okay, we'll see you in the next one.